What happens when you get a ball and a boy? A ball boy, that's what you're probably thinking. However, let's kick it a notch higher and let's say a ball, a boy, passion. However, this is no ordinary boy, however, a silver-tongued wordsmith. You get the birth of a disky podcast that serves the beautiful game. However, the question remains, will he make it in the game? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Disky Talk with Leon. to the very first visual episode of Disky Talk with Luyolo. Before I head into today's episode, I'd like to give a big thanks to a man who goes by the name of Bongani Baloi. He is very, very instrumental to what you see today. So, on today's episode, it's all things Kaiser Chiefs, Stuart Baxter, and Young Bafana Bafana Shining. However, before we get into it, I'd like to introduce my guest. He goes by the name of Javas. Javas, how are you doing, bro? I'm good, my brother. How are you? Uh, all is well, all is well. I'm so happy to have you on the very first visual episode of Disky Talk with Luyolo. So, let's get right into it. Um, when it comes to Kaiser Chiefs, uh, the biggest talking point throughout the season was mm. Gavin Hunt. We do know that he got sacked. What do you make of his sacking? Do you feel like it was the right thing to do by um, the Glamour Boys? Or do you feel like he should have gotten time with his own players in the new season? Personally, I feel like he should have been given maybe just one more season. Uh, I feel like the transfer ban for me was a bit of a, a major issue, in fact. Yes, we know uh, Ernest Merendorf uh, worked with these players and managed to get them to secure second spot. But uh, I feel like those players that we used uh, this season, they weren't Gavin Hunt's type of players, you understand? Yeah. And also, uh, Kaiser Chief is, is not a Gavin Hunt type of team. He's more of a Super Sport United, uh, Bitvis Vest, you know, those type of mid, not mid-table <laughs> teams, but top four, you know? Yeah. I think he does very well in those type of teams. So for me, I feel like he should have been given just a, a one more season at least, so we can actually... Like see because what yeah. would he do with his with his type of players? I understand because yeah. now I see they've brought in uh, Stuart Baxter and uh, to me it seems like a similar fit more <laughs> or less. You understand? Yeah. So I'm just like, uh, uh, we'll see where that goes. You know. Yeah, where that goes. So you know, when I first heard of the the sacking, I wasn't I wasn't surprised. You know, and the reason why I say so is because of looking at how things were going throughout the season. Mm. You know. My biggest concern was not the results. And I know a lot of people are going to be shocked by what I'm saying because it's a result oriented industry. However, in the first season, when a coach gets there, the, the most important thing is for that coach to somewhat build a structure and to identify certain players that will fit into his structure, his philosophy and style of play. And it's also for the coach to get to terms with everything within the club, right? So when you look at how he approaches games, that was my biggest issue. His approach to games was at oftentimes very negative. You know, in the beginning of the season, there were games where he approached um, the game with seven defensive players. Yeah. And when you, if you're going to coach Kaiser Chiefs, you know, some say the biggest club in South Africa. Some argue it and say, no, it's not. However, whatever you think it is, cool. If you're going to coach at a, Kaiser, at a Kaiser Chiefs, I feel that you need to approach games in a very positive manner. And if you approach games in a manner where you're going to start with seven defensive players, it becomes an issue, you know? Secondly, his adaptation. He never adapted to the status quo. So during games, he would never be able to uh, adapt to that specific game, you know, because he would just stick with whatever he intended to do from the beginning point. For example, this season, if you look at Anukovic, Anukovic, last season, he did really well. However, this season, a lot of PSL teams have started to figure him out. So a lot of PSL teams know how to plan against Kaiser Chiefs and they know how to mark Nukovic out of the game. For example, with him, Kevin Hunt would never 
change the system up a bit. If he saw that his main man, being Nukovic, um, was maybe isolated and marked, he'd never try to change the, the, the system up a bit. And he always continued with the crosses and the diagonal balls, which was becoming too predictable. So it's things that I look at like that. And him not being able to formulate his strongest eleven, him not consistently fielding players who are doing well, Whereas we saw so many times where Nkosi Pilen Ngobo, for example, would have a good run of games. Then before you know it, he's on the bench. Mm. And, you know, that for me then doesn't bode well for the player's confidence. However, moving on to um, the next segment, which has to do with uh, Mulif and Tseke. Yes, there was calls and uh, there was the memorandum. And there was uh, the fans <laughs> who marched to Naturana because yeah. they wanted change. And the first bit of change that came about was uh, Keza Chiefs appointing Muli Fenteki as um, the technical director and the head of youth development. What do you make of that appointment? Uh, for me personally, I feel like it's mixed emotion, you know. Uh, yes, he has a, a good uh, background in terms of development, you know. He's worked with uh, the under-17s all the way up to under 20, you know, and so on. And obviously, he's played in those big tournaments with the, the develop, development teams, you know. Yeah. So, for me, it's a perfect fit, you know. Uh, that's why I say it's mixed emotions for me, because looking at his background check, people would, like, argue and say, like, you know, not a lot of people know who this guy is, you know. And, like, his CV in terms of professional football level, you know, it's not so experienced as to other people you understand yeah. so that's why for me i feel like it's a perfect fit as a technical director yeah. and uh, obviously the head of development yeah so for me personally i'm looking forward to the future yeah i yeah. don't know how about you how do you feel yeah so the thing is I'll, I'll start with the man right um i like the man with regards to what he's achieved with development football in south africa and i like the work that he's done um, having been able to get to big tournaments with the with the junior with the junior nationals, also being able to um, be part and parcel of that Harmony Academy that has uh, developed. Um, I'll mention two notable players, Sipombule and Debucho Mukwena. So the work that he's done at grassroots level has been absolutely phenomenal. I like the man, and I like his poise. And um, very composed man, you know, so I like the man. However, when it comes to this specific role and when it comes to Kaiser Chiefs, if I have to be honest with you, that's where I have a qualm. That's where I have a problem. And I say this because when you listen to um, Mr. Mutaung and him in the um, interview he did when they appointed uh, Muli Finzeki, he was speaking about how they would like to return to their philosophy and that Kaiser Chiefs is um, a footballing side that plays uh, with a certain culture and a certain style of play. If you say you want to return to that, my biggest question is why then do you go and hire somebody who isn't cut from that cloth? The amount of success that he's had at youth development level. However, when it comes to Kaiser Chiefs, um, philosophy the culture he's he's not a man that has been there done that and got the t-shirt however a man that has been there done that and got the t-shirt is Farouk Khan mm. and that's personally an individual I would have looked at for this specific role head of youth and technical director and I say Farouk Khan because he's worked within the structures of Kaiser Chiefs and he's got a very reputable record when it comes to unearthing some of the best talent within the country. And uh, if you look at his um, own academy when, with Stars of Africa, the amount of players that he's been able to produce. And if you look at the bulk of these players end up playing in Europe, you know, uh, most notably being a Luther Singh, for example. I think in this country, we don't really have a player who's on that level with regards to the technical ability, you know. And if you look at uh, Luther Singh's numbers and performances in Portugal, he's doing really well from my perspective. So I think Farouk Khan would have been uh, the perfect appointment as technical director and head of youth development. And another thing, when I look at um, uh, uh, 
the appointment of Mulif and Zeki is okay, so you've got a technical director in, but the technical director has to more or less be in correlation with um, the coach mm. with regards to philosophy, with regards to style of play. So then it would then be interesting to see which kind of coach that they would get in. I'll give you an example. At uh, Manchester City, before they got in um, Pep Guardiola, they got in Chiki. Chiki was um, the former technical director at Barcelona. Mm. He worked with Pep Guardiola then, and they got him in at Manchester City before Pep Guardiola came through. And wh- why they did this was because they were trying to establish uh, youth development and structures that would feed into Pep Guardiola's first team in the near future. By the time Pep Guardiola took over at Manchester City, the structures were already in place from a development perspective. And that's when now you see your Phil Foden coming from the Manchester City development because the w- groundwork had been done. A. B. The work that was done with a Phil Foden was work that would predicate for him to be a immediate, su- immediate success into a Pep Guardiola starting eleven and into a Manchester City team that is led by Pep Guardiola. So with that example that I'm making, it's important that we see a conveyor belt and it's important that we see a clear path from development to reserve team and into the first team where the philosophy, the culture and the style of play are all aligned. Yeah, so um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with uh, Mulif and Tseki. And I'm a big believer in giving people a chance. Do, um, am I happy that they've got him in? Um, I'm happy that they've got a technical director. Yeah. I'm happy that they've got a um, uh, uh, head of youth development. However, I'm not happy with the personnel. You know, I think, like I, I say, I think that it should have been Farouk Khan. However, let's give uh, Mr. Nzeki a chance and let's see what he can do, you know, because another thing is we want to stay away from judging him with what happened with Bafana Bafana yeah. because a, a great example is Pito Musimano when he was at Bafana Bafana. He didn't really do well. He, now he's gone on to become one of the best coaches uh, in, in the world. Mm-hmm. So moving on to the big news that broke, Um, In the past week, uh, Stuart Baxter has been announced as um, the new head coach. Uh, What do you make of that? What do you make of his return? Do you think that he could lead the Glamour Boys back to success, considering that he was the last case Chiefs coach to win silverware? Yeah, I'm I'm sure the the fans are, like, very happy about the decision, you know, because, uh, like you said, he was the last coach to actually lead us to victory and you know uh, he brought in a very good style of play which we all know the famous transition so <laughs> I'm looking to see how going to the future what sort of type of system he's going to be uh, using you understand whether it's going to be the same one or not but then like I said earlier on for me he's kind of similar to a uh, Gavin Hunt you know they're not there's a lot of similarities for me so I'm just looking to see how there will be change uh, in terms of going forward, you know. Because if I point out Gavin Hunt, Ernest Middendorf, Stuart Baxter, <laughs> it's all a similar style of plays. And uh, we don't want to see the same type of football where we're re- relying on uh, Samir Nukovic and the whole uh, helicopter long ball. Football. Yeah, helicopter football, <laughs> as they call it nowadays, you know. You know, we don't want to see that, you know. So hopefully we can... Uh, put the ball ground on the on the ground and just move move it around, you know. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So my my next question then becomes, with his appointment, and going back to the point that I had made previously about um, having a technical director who's more aligned with the coach, do you see an alignment there? Yes, I will acknowledge that the two have worked together at Bafana Bafana, where Stuart Baxter was the head coach. And uh, Mr. Mulu Finteki was the assistant coach. However, when Stuart Baxter was the head coach at Bafana Bafana, we saw a different approach to the games. When Mr. Nteki was the head coach at Bafana, we saw also a different approach. So now you put these two men in the same technical team yet again. 
Do you see a correlation there? Do you see an alignment there? Or do you think it's counterintuitive to what they are trying to achieve with regards to going back to the philosophy? To me, you know, I'm not uh, quite sure where they like they are trying to, you know, take this. But like you said earlier on, I like the whole keeping the whole grassroots level thing, like Farouk Khan, you know, like uh, Junior Kanye always points out Farouk Khan and <laughs> how he's helped, you know, shape yeah. Kaiser Chiefs into what they were, you know, yeah. and going back to the early 2000s and things like that. So for me, if they could like keep that same structure, like for example, Adazwane, for me, not a lot of people know his background, but you know, for football lovers, you know, they will know his success in the development and the likes of the Ngobo, Happy, uh, Mashiyan, you know, yeah. those are quality players, you know. So I think, you know, maybe Bobby and Kaizam Dawung should have maybe given them just a chance, just six months, just so that we can see, because sometimes appointing uh, a coach is not always the solution, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. And I'm glad that you mentioned that point, because... I, if it were up to me and the onus fell into my hands, what I would have done was I would have not been so quick to appoint a, a head coach. Instead, I would have given Arthur Zwane and Dylan Shepard the chance, mm. you know, just for one season. Let's see what, what they can do. Especially because when you look at Arthur Zwane and you look at his track record with um, the reserve team, firstly, he's won um, the Disky Shield with uh, his reserve side. And... Uh, Whenever his teams do play, we always see a very good brand of football and we see lots of goals and they're a very competitive side. And thirdly, you have to look at um, how many players he's been able to mold and polish and ensure that their transition has been seamless into the first team. Mm. You mentioned Kosi Pile Ngoba earlier on. There's uh, Happy Mashiane, there's uh, Njabulo Plom and... Recently, there's Sabelo Khatel, mm. who's also coming through, who goes by the name of, well, nickname of Bibo, you know, and I like the look of him. So when you look at those kind of players, those kind of players coming through more or less that system that um, Arthur Zwane had built with the reserve side, it, it really puts a smile on your face. Mm. And I think I would have given Arthur Zwane a chance. And I say that because if you look at it in the past, uh, Ernst Minendorp has been given a chance. Steve Compella mm. has been given a chance. Solinas has been given a chance. So why can't we give um, one of our own one a chance? Own. You're right. You know? And if you say that you're trying to get back to the philosophy, you're trying to get back to the um, cultural ways of doing things from a Kaiser Chiefs perspective, then who better than a person who's been at Kaiser Chiefs for the, the, for the past 15 years plus? You know, and also a Farouk Khan then, you know, because then you more or less have people who have a similar philosophy and an ideology when it comes to football. So I personally would have given Arthur Zwane a chance. And especially because if you look at the last two games, the performances, you know, the players have performed a lot better. The players look a lot more comfortable. You look at a player like uh, Lebu Manyama, you know, when last did we see a goal scoring Lebu Manyama? Yeah. You know, it's been a very long time, you know, but in that game against Golden Arrows, he was able to exert himself, he scored a hat-trick, and you look at Nkosi Pile Ngobo, for example, uh, a player who I think if played in uh, a system that predicates for his ball-playing abilities, I think he'd do really well. And I say that because when you start to watch his um, most recent performances under Arthur Zwane, when the team is seemingly starting to put the ball on the ground and shift it a lot quicker, you start to see him doing well, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's just my opinion that I would have gone with, 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 with Arthur Zwane. I think, he would have been, I think he would have been a very good fit and it would have been unpopular, you know? However, I think it would have been a good fit and I think Chiefs should have taken a leaf out of Barcelona's book mm -hmm. when the revolution took place when Pep Guardiola took over and he had a chance yeah. and he used a lot of those um, youngsters that he was coaching in the reserve team and in the, um, in the B team as well. So I think that's what should have happened. However, going to uh, Stuart Baxter, with regards to success, he matches the, the brand 
you know, because at the end of the day, Kaiser Chiefs is a huge brand and you'd like to align yourself with individuals who have won silverware. You'd like to align yourself with great coaches as well. So I think he's a very good coach. That's my opinion. I really like Stuart Baxter. However, does he fit into the current mold? I don't really think so. Does he have a, a style of play and a philosophy that will predicate for the success of those younger boys coming through the ranks? I also don't think so. Because we have seen in the past that he is... He, he favors the more experienced player, mm. you know. And he's a coach that we haven't really seen use a lot of youngsters. But right now, Keza Chiefs are producing a lot of youngsters. Mm. And they're producing youngsters who, in my opinion, they're ready to play first-team football on a regular basis. They're ready to have the team being built around them, you know. And for me, age is not a factor. Because when you look at Nobo, you look at Mashiane, these are players who are in their early 20s. But in Europe, in your early 20s, you're already a key player for mm. your team. And that's what we should be doing. We should be building a team around these young players, you know. So with regards to this specific appointment for Kaiser Chiefs, I don't advocate for it. I don't think Stuart Baxter was the right man for Kaiser Chiefs. And the status quo with what's currently happening with them bringing through all these young players, because... That youth development system is a goldmine. There's so many quality footballers yeah. coming through. Will they get a chance? You know, that's a very big question and that remains to be seen. Yeah. However, there has been lots of talk with regards to players. And um, which players would you... If you had a chance to sign, you know, going into the new season, which players do you think Kaiser Chiefs should be looking at and players that could make a difference? I'm really happy with the quality of performance from uh, uh, Kutumel. He yeah. had a great season at uh, Maritzburg. He's been scoring goals. He's been assisting. You know, I think he helped them a lot to get out of that uh, relegation zone. Yeah. You understand? So if it wasn't for him, you know, I, I don't think they would have been where they are right now. <laughs> so, yeah. Obviously, the boy was at uh, Pirates. It didn't work out. So, Clearly, he's more experienced now, yeah. with a good age. So, you know, I think he would be a good fit, you know, for the team. Yeah. Or just for any big team, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and also, the, the boys at Swallows, I love the way the team plays, you know. Mm. You come back from winning NFT and you just go straight into competing. I mean, we saw the first quarter of the season. They were the ones actually competing with Sundance. They were giving them the go-ahead, you know. Yeah. So, if I look at... Uh, the center back in Jabulo, you yeah. know, quality player, very comfortable on the ball, you know. So yeah, those are the players I I personally yeah. I like. Yeah, and also Hamaldin, you know, many would write him off saying that he's a bit old, you know, but we saw this season he was banging in the goals, you know. Yeah. Not just banging them in but also assisting because you yeah. know he knows how to play as a proper center forward, which mm -hmm. we don't have such quite, such players anymore. And know? his movement off the ball as you well. Know, you understand players who can assist and also score goals at the same time. So yeah, those are the three standout players for me that I personally are a good fit. That you think are a good fit. And sticking to Swallows, what do you think? Um, it's been rumored that uh, Sihota is is on his way to Naturena. Do you think that would be a good signing? Very quality, very quality. He's good, but he's comfortable on the ball. I like his pace also. Yeah. Uh, his hunger, you know. And the boy has stamina, you know. I love. <laughs> For, uh, you know, Kaiser Chiefs, their midfield need, it needs a lot of energy there, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if the likes of Katande, they're tired, but, you know, it just needs a lot of energy there. So I think he'd like, be a. Uh, a good, a good fit for the team. And when we look at... I just want us to look at the goalkeeping situation. Right? A lot has been said. We do know that uh, there's uh, Dumini Mpune, there's Daniel Akpe, there's Bruce Bavuma. And what, 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 what do you think when it comes to the goalkeeping department? Do you think that it's time to find Itumile Mpune's successor? Or do you think that... Um, do you think that Itumile Mkuni can still, can still give us something going forward? Or do you feel that, no, time is up, maybe we need to look outside of the club for his successor? What, what's your take on the goalkeeping situation? 
Yeah, Mzansi is number one. Unfortunately, you know, if I assess his performance over the past two, three seasons, you know, it hasn't been, like, at its peak, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, for example, it disappoints me because during his peak, we had quality keepers. Second mm-hmm. choice and third choice, we had Rad P- Peterson, and we also had Brilliant Kuzwan. Oh. Quality keepers. And now, you know, they have obviously they're not at the club anymore. Yeah. And it's not I'm not saying that Bavuma's not a quality <laughs> keeper. But when I'm yeah. comparing him to Kuzwai who went to Pirates, you know, and Peterson who went to Sundowns, you know. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why such big teams obviously went for them, you know. Yeah. So personally, you know, it's a tough one because Kune is very injury prone, number mm. one. He's been in and out. So, you know, in terms of consistency, I'm not too sure going forward, you know. I think it's time for a change. Personally, as a fan, I think it's time for change. Um, also, with Akpe, yes, he's come in. He's kept clean sheets. So, I think we should stick to him going um, forward into the new season yeah. and see how that will obviously turn out, you know. Yeah. So, with regards to the goalkeeping situation, I... It's going to be, whichever decision Keza Chiefs take in the transfer window, if they do go out and sign a goalkeeper, or if they do decide that, you know what, we're going to give Bruce the number one um, jersey, we're going to allow him, we're going to give him a chance to grow in this position, it's going to dictate a lot of things going forward. And I say that because when you build a team, you build from the back, you progress up. However, in my own opinion, part of the players that I would go out and sign I just honestly believe that if you're a Kaiser Chiefs and if you want to compete, if you want to get back to the very top and compete against Sundowns, because that's the benchmark. Mm. Mamelodi Sundowns is the benchmark. If you want to compete, you're going to have to break the bank. Mm. Starting in, um, the goal, in, in the goals, I'd go out and sign Ricardo Goss from Mamelodi Sundowns. Mm. And I say that because I like the way he plays. You know, not just from a goalkeeping perspective, but he's very comfortable on the ball. He can play out from the back. If you want to go back to the philosophy, you want to go back to that culture that we all grew to love when it comes to the Glamour Boys, then I think you're going to need a ball-playing goalkeeper who's very good at distributing the ball. Just like Kune was, you know. So I think I would go out and get Ricardo Goss and I would have him competing with uh, Bruce you know, I think Bruce would be uh, a very good backup. Arguably, he could also be a number one. I think in that position, then you have very good competition. And then, let's look at the centre-back position. I think that's where Kaiser Chiefs really need to get players. I would go out and get uh, Bushem Kwanazi. I would go out and get uh, yeah. Block and Jabulong Novo. Yeah. I think when you've got those two at the heart of defence, you then create a, a solid centre-back partnership, which is very important. You know, if you don't have a solid centre back partnership, you're not going to you're not going to win any any trophy. You know, let alone the league title. And if you look at Kaiser Chiefs, that's that's been one of our biggest problems this season. You know, we've struggled at the back, inconsistent partnerships, inconsistent back four. So it's been a, a very big problem. But when you get Bushem Kwanazi and Jaulu Ngobo, who are both very comfortable on the ball, I think then we start to more or less. Uh, form a structure which will see us start to play up from the back because when you have got a goalkeeper who's comfortable on the ball, when he rolls it out he's rolling it out to Njabulo Ngovo or he's rolling it out to Abushim Kwanazi you know, moving into midfield these are two players who I think look, Keza Chiefs Mr. Keza Mutao he has to break the bank, mm. he has to go out and sign Sipo Mbule mm. and Debo Khomukwena if he can you know, and then there's no data as well. So there's those three players. From those three, at least if you can get two of them. Mm. But preferably Mbule. I think yeah. Mbule is, is fit for the jersey. And I think that's a player that could uh, grow in that midfield of Kaiser Chiefs alongside Nkosi uh, Mpile uh, Ngobo. Um, you know, and other players that I would also have a look at. You, you look at um, Sikota coming back. Uh, I think he's a very good signing. I think it's been a long time since Kaiser Chiefs had uh, an out-and-out winger who was explosive and dynamic. Nowadays, Kaiser Chiefs, we don't really have explosive and dynamic wingers who can win a game by themselves. 
<coughs> sorry, who can win a game by themselves. And um, given Tiberi as well, returns from solos, from his loan. I think that's a key player that we're going to use going forward. So that's a player I'll definitely be looking at. And then moving, progressing into um, the final third, the goals. There's two players that I'll be looking at. And also, yet again, breaking the bank. Bradley Krobla and Tabiso Kutume. When you get those two strikers, you got two strikers who have different skill sets. They give you uh, different dynamics and they add a different dimension, which then allows that team to set up in multiple ways. So those are the type of players that I'd be looking at that would come in and join. Because I do think that Kaiser Chiefs, there are a couple of quality players within the side. You know, as much as people might be complaining and saying that there's no players, there's no quality. However, there is quality there, you know. And um, moving on, what then do you predict going into the CAF uh, Champions League semi-final? We are going to play against uh, Widad Athletic Club. So we will be traveling to Morocco as Kaiser Chiefs. Do you feel like we stand a very good chance of causing an upset or do you think that um, Widad, this is a, an easy win for Widad? You know, it's a, it's a surprise for <laughs> the, the football lovers across yeah. Africa, you know. It's a, foot, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's a shock because, I mean, they did so, they performed so dismally in the league, yet in the Champions League, you know, they managed to get themselves into the semi-final, you know. Yeah. So, for me, I think themselves as a club and as players, you know, they are <laughs> they are surprised as we are. You know? Yeah. So you know, one might say that they had maybe had the easier route to the compared to Sundowns. Yeah. You know, who were, you know they had a they were in a group of dead and you yeah. know as well as you know going to the knockout phases. But then you know we shouldn't uh, rule out our team just based on how they performed. In the league and also the way they play, you know, clearly the long ball uh, football is working in Africa, you know? <laughs> but it's not working on home soil, you know, it's not working yeah. on home soil. So I think going t- into that fixture, I'm very keen on seeing how we're gonna perform away. Yeah, I mean, if we can get that crucial away goal, mm-hmm. then I think it'd be an advantage for for us going into the second leg. So uh, with wider, I mean, they're a big team, you know. They have experience in the Champions League, so they are the favorites coming into the, this game. You know. Yeah, definitely, they'll definitely be the favorites coming into this game and um, history as well. You know, um, a lot of our teams struggle whenever they go up north. You know, we do know that uh, the north, the North African giants are very competitive and they're very strong, especially in the latter stages of the CAF Champions League. However, I'm going to say this, which is a very unpopular opinion. I think. Kaiser Chiefs have an outside chance of even going on to actually win the CAF Champions League. And I know that's a very unpopular opinion. And people are going to be thinking, what is this guy saying? You know? And the reason why I say so, you know, I, I believe that um, the, 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 the gods, you know, when it comes to football, the gods of football have, have just been on Kaiser Chiefs' side throughout the tournament, you know? Mm. And... Considering how they got out of that group, you know, yet again, it was fortuitous for them that they managed to, in, when they needed the three points, they didn't play against, um, they didn't play against a, 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 a strong side. The head coach didn't even, didn't even pitch for the game, you know. <laughs> yeah. They were basically playing a second string, second string side and they still man, they managed to get the three points and they managed to qualify, you know. And when you look at their, their pathway... And you look at how they performed against uh, Simba as well. You know, one would then think that Simba didn't really do their background, um, their background uh, research when it comes to Kaiser Chiefs, because all Kaiser Chiefs did in that game was play very direct football, and they kept playing those crosses. You know, however, on home soil it doesn't end up working because a lot of teams know how Kaiser Chiefs play. And going into this semi-final, I think it's going to be very tough for them. However, where the players are mentally and emotionally, I think they're in a very good space. They're very relaxed. And they're playing for a coach in Arthur Zwane who, 
who is allowing them to make mistakes, mm-hmm. you know, but most importantly, allowing them to express themselves, mm-hmm. you know, whereas a lot of coaches don't often allow that. And I always say that body language speaks the loudest. And you could tell with the body language in the past couple of weeks that Kaiser Chiefs players, they're in a happier space. And you can tell that they're happy with their technical team. They're happy with what's currently going on at the club because they look a lot more relaxed. However, I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be a battle. It's going to be tough. However, I will stick to my guns and say that Kaiser Chiefs have an outside mm. chance of causing an upset. Mm. So, moving on to the extra time segment. It wouldn't be a disky talk with Liolo without an extra time segment. This is the segment where we conclude the episode. And on today's extra time segment... We are going to discuss Bafana Bafana, who played against Uganda in the past couple of days, and they managed to win 3-2. Uh, a lot of players got their debuts. What do you make of that result and that performance? It's a good start. Uh, it's a good start for the new coach as well. You know, you want as a new coach, you want to get off. Uh, to a winning hit, start. Yeah, you want to hit the ground uh, rolling same time, you know, so... I mean, for the fans at home, you know, it's been a very sad journey, you know, of decades and decades. <laughs> you, you don't know when it's going to end, you know. Yeah. Because we have such the foundation of our football, you know, winning the 1996 uh, um, CAF, you know, and then from qualifying two World Cups, and then after that it just went completely mm-hmm. south, you know. So, I mean, the expectation from us, because... Uh, we are the, you know, we've got the resources and all of that, you know, but it just doesn't work out. So I think the fans were obviously shocked. Not, yeah, yeah because we are, you know, we, we used to, you know, <laughs> getting bad results, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, you know, it was a good uh, start for Hugo. Not a lot of people know him, mm. uh, but, you know, hopefully this is the turning point, but I don't think he is the solution. Like I said, it starts from grassroots, you mm. know. It also, Safa, you know. I mean, uh, personally for me, I feel like the president himself, he's been there for years. <laughs> and clearly, you know, the results don't speak for itself. I don't see the need for him to continue to rule, you know. I don't, yeah. you know, and many would agree with me. Yeah. understand the people who should be in Safa are the people who played uh, in those two World Cups in 2002 our legends Lucas Hatere you know those those are the players who should be there in Safa so you know they are nowhere to be found so you know I don't know it's yeah. a sensitive topic Bafana yeah. Bafana I don't <laughs> know what do you think about that one yeah Bafana Bafana Ew. This 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 needs this needs not just an episode a whole series when it comes to Bafana Bafana, but so yeah when it comes to Bafana Bafana it's 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 a bit of a tricky one, you know. And I'll start with the administrative side, and I say that because I feel like the only time our national team will garner the success that we wish and hope for it to garner is when we see a change at the administrative level. Mm. So if we can see a complete overhaul within Safa, if we can see uh, a complete change and approach and attitude to development football as a whole, I think then we're then taking a step in the right direction. And I say that because uh, development has to be prioritized, you know. And take the 10,000 hour rule, for example. You'd equate that to what? Seven to ten years, Mm. you know. 10,000 hours of practice and if you look at it a lot of these teams in, in Europe and um, I will mention Europe because that's, that's, that's the benchmark you know and a lot of the teams in Africa which are able to, co- to qualify for the World Cup consistently and compete they are the benchmark their development systems and programs start a lot earlier than ours do right and also you have to take into consideration um the, um, the, the amount of players who are able to, to go from development to uh, the junior national teams to then Bafana Bafana, 
you know, there's not a lot of players who are making that transition. There's no continuity. There's no continuation process. Whereas if you look at a lot of national teams that find success at the highest level with the senior national team, you'll get to realize that a core of those boys have achieved national team success at lower levels. So they've won an under-17 World Cup. You know, so they've won a Euro under-20 World Cup. So they've won an AFCON under-17, you know. And they keep progressing as a group. Whereas in South Africa, a lot of players, we start to see them at Bafana Bafana. It's the first time you see a player getting a call-up, you know. And you ask yourself, where was this player, you know, prior to this, you know. A, B, the player wasn't developed properly. C, the player wasn't in the national team setup. You know, so those are the big issues when it comes to Safa on an administrative level. However, heading into the game against Uganda, uh, I'm going to start with the first half. So in the first half, I thought we were very poor. I thought we were very disorganized. I didn't quite understand uh, the system we were trying to play. Yes, on paper, it was 3-4-3. Three, three. However, I didn't quite see that. Denman Farmer as well in the midfield was very uncomfortable. I don't understand why you play a centre-back in midfield when you do have midfielders who can't play in midfield. So I didn't quite understand that, you know. However, I think second half we were able to rectify it. We came back, we looked a lot more sharper, we looked positive, and we're playing free-flowing football. And um, we scored very good goals. Credit must go to Evidence Mahopa, who I think had, uh, he had a very phenomenal game. And... Um, uh, Shong Wane as well, you know, those two players, young players who were competing in the DSTV Premiership this season and I, yeah, I'm really happy to see those youngsters coming through and making a difference. I was happy to see Spelele Mkulisi playing um, as the playmaker and him being able to contribute to um, the performance. Kutumela as well had a very good game. Um, the young boy in Ethan Brooks, he also had a good game. So it was lovely to see a different crop and a young crop. However, this is where my unpopular opinion is, right? My unpopular opinion is I would have not called those young players. And the reason why I say so is because in September, when we go play the World Cup qualifiers, chances are we're not going to see a lot of those players there. So this friendly was a perfect uh, opportunity to actually prepare for that, that the, the qualifiers in September. Mm. You know, that's just my opinion. And I say that with respect to the young players, because at the end of the day, you need to build um, a process which is very synonymous to a conveyor belt, you know. And it also then goes back to Mr. Mulefi's take his time when... He would play in friendly matches. He'd call up a different squad. But then when we'd go play the AFCON qualifiers, then we'd see a different crop, you know? So then there's a, a disconnect there, you know? So that's my first qualm. Secondly is the system that we play with. Um, I understand that modern day football has transitioned to a point where we're playing as, with a 3-4-3. We're playing with the wing backs. However, I just feel that you need players for that system. And if you don't have the players for that system, it's pointless to transition to that system. You might as well build a system which predicates for the success of the crop that you have, mm. as opposed to trying to impose a system on players who might struggle with it. And I feel like we're being persistent with this system at national team level. However, I think the players are struggling with it. You know, And in the first half, defensively, you saw they struggled. Because playing with the three at the back is very different to playing with the two at the back. So I think we need to come up with a system at national team level that more or less um, most of our players fit into like a glove. You know, Because when you get called up into the national team, the turnaround time is very short. You only got two or three training sessions and that's it. You, know, you don't have two, three weeks to plan. You know, and get used to the system. But when there's a clear-cut system and a clear-set philosophy with regards to how do you approach games, how do we play, and a system that's comfortable to most players and that most players understand, it becomes very easy for them to get integrated when they get to national team, as opposed to them figuring things out on the field now when you're playing against the Uganda in the first half. If it's a qualifier, for example, you go 1-0 down, they go, they put the bus, we struggle throughout the game to find our feet. You know, so those are the two qualms that I have. Otherwise, I 
more or less, I'm happy. It's always good to see uh, Bafana Bafana winning a game, and it's always good to see it's always good to see a new crop coming through. However, if that new crop is not part and parcel of the the bigger plan, then I think it's pointless to call those boys up, in my opinion, because then it's better to plan for um, where you're going as opposed to just calling people up because you want to give them a chance. And um, what is your take on the upcoming uh, World Cup qualifiers? Do you think that we stand a good chance? And um, do you think we'll be able to actually go on and qualify for the World Cup? No, I think we're not, we're not ready yet, you know. Yeah. Until I see uh, consistency in terms of results, yeah. as qualifying, you know, we should look at the CAF, uh, you know, first, before we can start speaking about qualifying for the World Cup first. We yeah. need to dominate Africa. Yeah, and you know? AFCON, yeah. And uh, AFCON, you know, so that's why I get disappointed when, you know, um, Beatle, 2016, 2017, he was ruling uh, Africa. So why couldn't we use those majority of those players because you know clearly they are they are used to the conditions you know small things yeah. the, the pitch the weather you know because obviously you know the backgrounds are not the same you know yeah. so obviously the style of play things like that so I think majority of the that twenty sixteen uh, F um calf winning Sundowns team yeah. should have been. Uh, playing integrated in, into Bafana, Bafana. You understand? We see it happening a lot overseas. I mean, we saw uh, Spain winning the World Cup with Barcelona. With Barcelona, basically. basically, you know. So you know, a winning recipe should stick to that. You know. Yeah, definitely. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens going forward. However, I'm very excited for what seems to be like a new era. And um, yeah, it's it's it's. Time will tell, yeah. you know, time will tell. I also don't think that um, we are ready. However, if it's there for the taking, if we can compete, then let's go out and compete. I really do wish the best for Bafana Bafana, as, uh, as I'm very patriotic. And yeah, however, we've come to the end of yet another special episode of Disky Talk with Liolo. I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Thank you very much, Javas, for coming through and blessing me with your footballing knowledge and insight. It's a pleasure, my brother. Thank you, bro. Signing up.